Okay, here is the study. One thing, uh, growth marketing adoption. If you remember, we identified that 35% of respondents tried growth marketing, 25% of respondents did not try it, and 40% are planning to do so. Um, when we asked them, why did you not try to implement growth marketing in your organizations? And this is what was not uh, shown at the beginning of the conference. So we are not sure how to do it right. So you guys would probably be explaining how to do it right. They also said lack of resources. To, we don't have resources. We don't have people and like teams that you just mentioned. People probably do not know how to build those teams. Um, it does not fill our team and processes. We think it is risky to build growth marketing, and we are happy with the current model. So we have 8% of happy, lazy, happy slash lazy people, I think. Uh, again, when we asked why are you willing to implement growth marketing, what are your goals, it was all about revenue, conversion, making the product better, uh, increasing the retention, grow the user base, making changes faster, and build a more effective team. Um, speaking about the positive impact that the respondent shared with us, again, 87% said they are happy that there was a positive impact. Um, when they specify what was good, it was about conversion, it was about user base growing, retention, changes happening faster, product is getting better. So product, people, processes, and KPIs. That's how we can summarize it. And challenges of implementation. This is something that I would like to uh, pay attention to because people, do, a lot of, we identified that a lot of people do not know how to do it. So the challenges that marketing executives in different organizations are facing are the following. Build a new process, define the right KPI, come up with a challenging hypothesis. This is one of my favorite topics. Come up with challenging hypothesis, find and hire team members with uh, growth background, run A-B testing, communicate the value to the team, and no challenges, it went really smoothly. So again, we have small proportion of really uh, happy, lucky people. And my question again, when I'm showing the dashboard, I'm asking, are you tired of dashboard? And you say, no. yes or no? no? Say whatever you want, say it loud. Okay, run no dashboards. So the panel discussion is about uh, growth marketing adoption, positive impact of growth marketing, and challenges of uh, growth marketing implementation. So let's do this. Um, I would be asking questions, and you would be answering them, and whoever sits closer to me starts with it. That's why you said escape Yaroslav, get rid of him, right? So question number one is, and I bet you would answer differently. Give a definition of gross marketing. What is that? How do you, how do you define it? So when I think about growth marketing, it's kind of similar to how I think about a, an engineer that it's either a specialist or full stack. That's how I see the difference between growth marketing versus like traditional marketing. With growth marketing, it's full stack. You're thinking about the entire funnel from the top of the customer journey all the way down to an engaged, happy customer. And using data in the scientific method to prioritize and engage and drive opportunities across the entire funnel. And focusing that data on your North Star metric, the aggregate footprint of your product and user value. That's how I think about it. Full stack, data-driven, hypotheses, the North Star metric. Yeah, your turn. I'm not convinced that there's a, such a thing as growth marketing, actually. Uh, this is something well. I've riffed on for a long time. Now, hear me out. Uh, so I think that there's commonalities among growth marketers, or at least people who call themselves growth or like work in growth. We test things. We, we're generally data driven. And there's usually some c crossover from like product and marketing. So those are all like, I guess, that's clustered kind of commonalities. But I don't, I'm not totally convinced there's a growth marketing function. I think there's a growth function, though. And this is something I, I got into a debate about, actually, at a panel before. We were talking about what does growth mean, what does growth marketing mean, all of this. And I think it's an organizationally important thing 
because I think marketers have always aligned themselves, or at least any organization I've been in, with revenue, conversion, things like that. Traditionally, I don't think product teams have. Some maybe, but like not all. So I think that crossover effect, bringing growth and revenue and conversion to product managers, I think that's where growth came in and become, became necessary. But now, I'm actually thinking, thinking that growth as a function has less to do with the, the, the tactical implementation or running tests or anything like that. And I think in the future, we're going to see it move more as an infrastructure or an operational thing that actually is used to democratize and empower others to run experiments and to like own their own KPIs and be able to move them in, in certain ways. And I think we're seeing that with companies like Booking.com and, and, and others who basically have massive kind of organizations and everybody wants to run tests. And we have growth teams enabling that at scale. Yeah. Um, I um, agree with Chris and his definition. That's what I presented as well. In terms of having a growth marketing team, my experience has been that you know, traditionally, growth teams or the marketing teams used to work on the same things, like onboarding, let's say, or activation, activating a customer. But um, you know, they weren't really talking to their product counterparts. right? So at Uber, what happened was when we get these teams together, the product onboarding team and the email marketing team, which was focused on onboarding, we started to see experiments that the growth marketers did, which then translated into product uh, experiences that were built, right? That's something that uh, wasn't there in a traditional role, right? That, that close synergy between those teams. And that's why I feel there's, there is still a space uh, for growth marketing. And in a, in a very hypothetical world, I, I would believe that all teams should be working this way like we don't need a separate growth marketing team. Everybody should be putting on their hat uh, around how does my product work and how, do, how can I uh, message my, the core values of my product. But in reality, we don't have that focus because I said you know, companies as they grow, they just tend to focus on or try to optimize for their local uh, maximum, right? So, so that's why I think the growth marketing uh, plays that big role uh, to fill that void. Thank you. Uh, so. We've just seen that there is a huge portion of, of people that, that we uh, got this data from that either have not tried growth marketing or they are planning to. Like 40%, if I'm not mistaken, are planning to. And at the same time, they are afraid, not, not afraid, but they are concerned of, of the challenges that they are facing, right? And they do not know how to define the KPI, how to structure the teams, what kind of process to follow, and so on and so forth. And it's really interesting to uh, firstly learn more about your experience, like what was, first of all, what was the time and what was the company when you started doing growth? And what were the first challenges that you were facing, how you were resolving them, and like what did you start with, hiring a process, people or KPIs and, and, and all the stuff? You, you've been in Mozilla, like, for how many years? Yeah, like, eight years. So, was it in Mozilla when you started doing this, or before? I first called it growth at Mozilla. Okay. I think my aha moment for growth was, I think, around 2013. And when I learned about growth, you know, I... It was sort of like that aha moment. I'm like, ah, oh, that's that thing that I've been doing my entire career that's data-driven, hypothesis-driven, documentation, iterative loops, and so on. It, like, it gave it a name. Okay, and so there is no like, a clear starting point, right? Okay. For, for, my, for my experience, it, it, was, it felt like an evolution. Got it. I, I was, it's sort of, to not quote like Fight Club, the movie, the book, <laughs> like it was sort of like it was the thing that we were always thinking about it just, we gave it a name. And there's obviously tactics and process that has commonality, but you sort of have to experience it for yourself. Understand how to become data-driven and have put that growth mindset on. And I personally like the way you're describing this as evolutionary. So it's not like you show up to the office, we're a growth team now. Yeah, and yeah that, that seldom happens, right? You have to prove yourself. Um, and, and I think to your question, where do you start? is finding out an area that's impactful, but nobody has tackled yet in the company. And the, the example of trigger emails at eBay, uh, I was in the exact same position. I was like, hey, I don't have engineers, I don't have um, um, you know, product person to work with, 
how do I start? And so I said, okay, let's just start small. Instead of thinking about the end vision of building out a broad scale you know, growth team with complex processes and all, start small. Start with an area that you're comfortable with, you know that nobody is focused on that, and you know the resources are there available for it. Um, just focus on it and, 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 and show these impact. I think that's how you start building um, growth. So I started a company with uh, three founders and me, so there was no such thing as a silo. Like we were just working across teams and departments and all that <laughs> stuff because it was four people. So we cared about the whole funnel, obviously, and we were doing this thing where we were trying to find acquisition channels and make, make sure that we have a business model. So I started my career doing, I guess, technically growth. So I kind of came into it naturally, and I never did anything except that. Moved to Conversion XL, where we were a growth company. So like, again, it's a small one as well. But then I moved into HubSpot, and it was a completely different thing. But there was already a big culture of growth there. So it wasn't like I needed to reinvent anything. I didn't really need to evangelize much. Of course, there's teams and like, uh, departments that don't totally get it, and we, we bump up against them from time to time. It, it, it's usually like hashed out, and, and we get over it, and then they get bought, bought into the growth process. Just because there's so much of a culture of it already. I think it started when uh, Brian Belfort came in, and, and uh, Sidekick was like the basically startup within HubSpot, and they, they built that process from there. Now, my question would be, everything came very frictionless for me because I was at either small companies or a company that had a built-in process. If you're at a big company that doesn't have that, and you're not the like CEO or like you don't have a ton of clout, how do you do that in that type of company? That that's what I would be curious about because I've never had any pushback with growth. It's always been like, yeah, run a, run a test, go ahead. You know, it, I've never had pushback. I guess I can I can speak to that. So when we started growth at Adobe, this was almost a year ago. We started small with Lightroom, right? And um, you know, for Adobe, I think we are getting a lot more hobbyists. So traditionally, we used to have professionalists use you know, Photoshop and Lightroom, but now we have a lot more hobbyists coming in, and hence retaining them and showing them the value proposition of the product becomes so much important. And so the teams are focused, the product team is focused on building the next best product, right? The marketing teams are uh, focused on building awareness, right? They're doing like paid media and building awareness of Lightroom because Photoshop is such a big brand, so Lightroom isn't. And so we want to build that. And so, but nobody's focusing on, hey, this is the new set of customers who's co who are coming in. How can we get them to realize the value prop of Lightroom as quickly as possible, right? So that's what the team focused on. We started very small, and we actually begged and borrowed resources across the company, right? So we had an analyst, uh, and we had a designer and a product manager, right? So those are three. The product manager was the only fully staffed person. The analyst was doing a part-time job. The designer was also doing a part-time job. But then when we started to focus on um, the initial part of the journey, what we saw was like after four, the first four weeks are the crucial in terms of retention. If you lose a customer in the first four weeks, you, it just goes down, the retention curve, right? So we focused on it. We helped improve those metrics. And then you know, Shantanu, uh, he actually saw some of those results. And uh, he was excited. And he said, hey, we want to invest in this kind of thing more and hence, we got some buy-in, right? But it all starts with starting small, building credibility, showing an impact, and showing a way of growing. I think that's helpful. Yeah, uh, my experience, I think, could maybe be the definition of friction. It was, so I've been at Mozilla for eight years, and when I first joined, I was going to be creating a full-stack like web marketing team. We're going to have engineers, analysts, data people. But there was really no North Star for Mozilla or for the team overall, like no real kind of metrics. So I eventually spun off that team and created like the first iteration of the growth team. And it was like nonstop friction in every single turn, like in, in ways that probably most organizations don't even have to worry about. I mean, I even got like bug mail and literally almost like hate mail. They're like, who the hell is this Chris Moore character <laughs> trying to run A-B test with Firefox's products? Do they realize that we're Mozilla? We don't do that. Like there were some like foundational questions like that. They're like, Mozilla doesn't collect data on anything, so you can't run an A-B test on anything, period. Like it was that kind of friction like right away from the open source community. And so like right away, I'm like, this is going to be really challenging to do my job to really feel like I can move that needle. 
if I'm dealing with this friction every moment of the way. So what it took early on, I went to the CEO and I told him like, there's a lot of opportunity here, but I'm hitting friction every turn in the organization and in the community. And I need a little bit of breathing room. So he gave me like six weeks, unlimited budget, and allowed me to pull people from any part of the organization and assemble a team and see how much I could do within six weeks. I think what you're saying is, <clears throat> is a good answer to one of the graphs that we've just seen communicate the value to the team, right? Why you are not starting is because we don't know how to communicate the value to the team, and this is, this is a perfect case, actually. So if you guys have difficulties how to communicate the value of the growth marketing to your CEO or your team or whatever, come back to the office and say, Chris Moore from Mozilla said that. <laughs> I also noticed a trend in that it's, it's about starting small, and instead of trying to evangelize something and, and persuade and cajole, you instead just, well, you ask forgiveness, not permission, start small, and usually something relatively riskless, get results, and then people can't really argue with that. You bring that and say, hey, I can do more of this at scale. Can we get some resources? Can we get some buy-in? But you're basically like de-risking the situation instead of up front being like, all right, I need a designer, a developer, all these things, 12 months, let's do this. It's like you get some results and you don't apologize. You say, look, I've got numbers to prove that this works. And then you've got buy-in because who can argue with that, right? Yeah, and, and I think it's usually better to start that way, build your credibility, because otherwise the expectation is already sky high, right? Like your CEO is like, hey, I gave you four designers, product managers, show me the results. I want to see it next week, the week after. And you know, there's no breathing room. So you want to ease and build, build it out and prove the credibility. If you're given, then it's also a different kind of a game. <laughs> One tactic that actually was super useful for that evolution for myself and growth at Mozilla is along the way, I would find people that had that growth mindset that really wanted to change the world and do it by being data-driven. You'd find that person and you'd plant that seed you would give them some tools, some understanding, some breathing room to do something and allow them to become the evangelist on their own team. That was really impactful because it took about a year to sort of like change the culture of Mozilla overall to accept the idea that we can be data driven but also to be focused on user privacy and security. We, we knew that we could do it but we sort of had to start slow, show the, and prove the value of it. But planting all those seeds eventually, eventually came back where about a year, year and a half later, the little growth teams popped up all over the organization using the same methodology and tools that if that didn't happen, I would have been hitting that friction over and over again. They became my evangelists. I didn't have to push the culture anymore. I think a lot of companies, well, it's on a scale, right? Like some of them are relatively frictionless and everybody's bought into growth. Like booking.com, Uber seems to have had an early start on that, Facebook, et cetera. Most teams are in the, or most companies are in the middle though where you probably have mostly a traditional culture, but you have a couple people who are curious about something like that. So I, I think if you have none of those, then you're at the wrong company and you should probably just move. But um, if you have a couple, I think teaming up is a great idea. But you said the CEO was bought in at least to some extent. Was that something you worked on or yeah. he already like, knew he, about or? He believed in the idea. So I pitched to, to him and told him like, this is the idea. I ran some things myself without telling anybody that I did this experiment. Like I had to kind of do a lot of things behind the scenes to like show it to him and like I presented and he was like, where'd you get this data? I'm like, I ran an experiment. And he was like, were you allowed to do this? And I'm like, I just did it. I just, did, I just ran the experiment. Yeah. What is the worst that could happen? Uh, and, and so I used that to plant the seed with him and he was like, okay, you got six weeks, prove it to me that this is something that the entire organization needs to rally around. And if you could speak a little bit on this process when um, you get a green flag in terms of get the people, get things done, do whatever you want in six weeks, you said, right? Um, was it like more of an internal hiring, external hiring? What was that process? Uh, the early days, it was mostly uh, an internal hire and then a few external hires. Uh, because at the beginning, you know, the organization didn't really want to put a lot of investment in this until they can kind of prove out the hypothesis that this is something that we should invest in further. So it was really kind of like finding those key people in the organization that had a growth mindset, that liked moving quickly, like they were comfortable with failing, because we probably know a lot of people that 
are like obsessive over the details and like are not comfortable with failing at all. So find those people that are like, as you mentioned, like 80% like, yeah, that's good enough, move, go forward, go fast, break things and iterate. Find those people, rally around them, borrow them for a few weeks, work on things, prove the value, and then use that to sort of like bootstrap the rest of the team into the future. When you have six weeks like that, uh, you talked about growth models earlier, that seems like a arduous process a little bit. Do you over-index on something like ease, or like do you actually like try to weigh out all the impact of different things? Yeah, that, six weeks is like not a long time. Yeah, that that six weeks was not really a long time. So I was really messy uh, during those six weeks, just going at whatever the biggest channel that I could find, the easiest, quick wins. There was nothing in that six weeks that I would say that the win was sustainable forever. It was really just to sort of like get the executive buy-in at that point in time. But again, as we talked about earlier, with the amount of users that are coming through Mozilla's funnels. Like it didn't require a lot of time to get significant results on anything when you have a million users a day activating within the product. I do the same thing. I always try to go for the easy ones, mm -hmm. low hanging fruit. You eventually wins. exhaust those, yeah, but yeah, yeah, in early days, that's all I needed. Yeah, but then you buy so, in and you're good to try. Yeah, there the was so much, yeah. so much like low hanging fruit because nobody was running any experiments before then. Yeah. One one thing that I would like, um, and I think people here would like to hear from you is. The KPI, because again, the data that we've just seen, people are struggling um, in the definition of the right KPI, right? And everyone talks North metric. Everyone says you have to have it. And having uh, talked to people and companies here in Ukraine, what, what I personally seen a lot and, and keep hearing a lot, we define the North Star metric. We like had thousands of meetings with important people, stakeholders, developers, designers, everyone expressed their vision, opinion, blah, blah, blah. And we think this is something we have to measure. And we are measuring this, or they are measuring this, and then a quarter later, it turns out that it's not that informative, it's uh, not clear to developers and stakeholders in exactly the same way, and blah, 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 blah. So, is that okay to change it fast? If yes, no. If yes, why? If no, why? Um, if you think it should be changed, how often and what are the circumstances in which it, the North Star metric should be changed? And what, what if you cannot find one? What, what should you do, actually? Yeah, that's a problem if you can't find one. <laughs> but I, like I was answering, one of the questions is, it's okay to change the North Star metric but not frequently, right? If you do it frequently, then what you're doing is you're disrupting your entire team because they all are focused on that metric and moving that metric. Now they have something else that they have to focus on and that's completely going to demoralize the team, right? So you want to stick with the, North, and so you have to do the due diligence before ahead of time when you come up with the North Star metric to a thorough qual and a quant to make sure that's, that's the right metric. You can move it maybe like three months or six months, or not even three months, I think six months down the line, when you have seen that you put in a, a sufficient effort around it and it's still not moving. The other important thing I, I want to emphasize here is how do you measure it, right? Because often than not, you know, you see the metric in your experiment level, AB level, and then you say, hey, yeah, it's, it's working and it's moving the North Star metric. But then the point that I made in my presentation is, how do you link that to the business metric, the broader business metric? And the way you can do that is by using a universal holdout where you exclude the people from the treatment, right? Every, like 5% of your population is not going to receive any of the treatment or any of the work that you're doing within the growth squads or the growth team, right? And then you measure the business metric against that uh, you know, control group and you say, hey, I moved the North Star metric here in the treatment. Did it ultimately move the business metric if I compare it to the control group, which didn't receive it at all? Because the treatment group is not only receiving one experiment, they're receiving like 10 different experiments, right? So one experiment, it's gonna be hard to move the business metric, but cumulatively, when you have 10 experiments, did they move it, right? I think that's, that's the kind of mindset that we have and I haven't really seen a lot of organization think about the holistic impact of growth initiatives by using like a universal holdout. I think that's, that's, a, that's the next evolution within growth. So with North Star Metrics, we're all at kind of bigger complex organizations. That's something I've struggled with because it's technically supposed to be something that the whole 
company rallies around, right? Mm -hmm. Do you guys have one North Star metric for your whole company? Or do you have, because like my team has a different North Star than like our product growth team and like our activation team and stuff like that, simply because it would be almost impossible for us on the acquisition team to run experiments that actually track down to monetization. So I, I've always wondered how that works. Like at startups, it was, it was quite a bit easier, but at HubSpot, I, I literally have no idea how we, would, how we would do that like universally. Yeah, w w for a while we did have a, like a central North Star that was really just like the aggregate footprint of our browsers globally. But it just, like you were alluding to, like just having one made it really difficult for teams to sort of like attach their efforts to that one North Star metric. It just felt too abstracted. So, so this year we have like three North Star metrics that are all very, very much like interlinked. It's reach, relationships, and resilience where reach is the overall footprint relationships or people that we have like a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, via multiple channels. And in resilience is kind of like a more politically correct, at least for Mozilla, revenue mm, yeah. overall. And they're all interlinked with each other because imagine that like to have, to generate revenue for Mozilla's business model, you need to have a relationship with somebody. To have a relationship with somebody, you have to have a, a reach. You know, there has to be humans in the world using your products. But it's really, I mean, going back to your question about like the, the frequency of how often you should be re rethinking the North Star metric, I don't think any less than a year that you should be like changing the direction of the organization because the only time that I think that maybe you should change it earlier than that, if there is like an issue in the organization where they don't understand the North Star metric. Because at the end of the day, like if everybody can't repeat the same words back about what the North Star metric is, why it matters to the customer, and why it matters to the business, then you get a problem. Because when that happens, everybody invents like a different version of how they view the North Star metric, and then you have people overlapping or going in different directions that are really not adding up to anything. So it has to be like easy to digest. Everybody should be able to repeat it back, nice, simple terms. And if that's not happening, that would be like a real cause to, to change it sooner than a year. Yeah, and I would also say that the North Star metric should be sensitive enough, right? Meaning when you do experiments, you should be able to see movement. If you look at monthly active users, it's such an aggregate metric, it's going to be really hard for experiments to move monthly active users because the signal that you're going to get from your treatments, honestly speaking, growth marketing, you're like chipping at it, right? You're doing like smaller experiments to see and the small experiments are not going to reflect in a bigger change in your monthly active users, right? So you want to choose a North Star metric, like Chris said, which can be easily understood by the organization. At the same time, is sensitive enough for your particular area, like for activation or active use or resurrection. Choose it wisely. That's where I was kind of going, is our team, we're split into like acquisition, that's my team, and then activation and monetization. So we all have like North Star metrics for that. It's, it's more of an OK, OKR model, actually, because at ac activa um, acquisition, we want more users. That's our goal overall. Activation wants more active users. Monetization wants more paying customers. So within each of those, we have different people working on different things. So within ac acquisition, we have, I'm working on free meme acquisition, primarily through the surround sound and or organic stuff that I talked about. We have an affiliate person. We have all these different teams. So then those goals that we have on individual teams correlate with like overall signups, which eventually downstream lead to our actual North Star, which I guess is weekly active teams for our CRM. So that's kind of the aggregate thing, but no one person could actually move that metric. Mm -hmm. So we create things that are sensitive enough to actually track, to actually run experiments on, and to incentivize like that overall holistic growth, and they all kind of feed into that kind of primary metric that we look at as the overall health of our business, I guess. Another thing that I wanted to talk about, and I think a lot of people here would like to hear your expert opinion. So it is a common belief that growth teams should not operate with ideas, but with hypothesis. And if you could um, explain what's your understanding of the difference between the no matter how great idea and a decent hypothesis, like what's, what's the actual difference, how hypothesis should be built, who should be involved, how many hypotheses should a team generate, is there a correlation with the size of the team, and how many do you need to, um, like what's the percentage of successful ones? If you have 100 hypotheses, how many good ones should you expect? 
I think most people confuse a hypothesis with an idea and a prediction more actually because people people will put forth a hypothesis like I think if we make this change it will increase signups by 20%. Well, how do you falsify that? It's impossible. That's not a hypothesis, right? So I think you start with a hypothesis, which is like a belief state about the world you see today and a possible piece of evidence for it. So like we think that users are not signing up for our service because the onboarding flow is too long and that creates friction. Then you can falsify that and then you can run multiple ideas against that. But the hypothesis stands as a, as a belief state and any additional idea, such as cutting off a form field or adding like fun animation or whatever, whatever idea your creative teams come up with, those can be uh, filtered through and like tested against the hypothesis. But the hypothesis is really just like a statement to like push for learnings, I guess. Because then you have something to stand by where, where you're trying to like falsify and understand the, the actual state of the world and the product. Yeah, and I want to say all hypotheses stem from an insight, right? So, uh, you know, an example at Uber was like, the insight is that the, the, the funnel is, is, is quite, there's quite a lot of friction right? Um, and so then the hypothesis is by introducing a chat bot, I can help reduce friction by X percent, right? Um, so I think, so we, the, the way we used to do our planning, like um, uh, quarterly planning, was lay down all the insights that we have, and then against these insights, have data around what percent of our customers is this getting impacted, right? Um, and then come up with hypotheses around what can help you either increase that number or reduce that number, right? And, and th that's how you start to generate it. Um, and, you know, the teams, uh, you know, sometimes come up with um, ideas, like product managers would come up with ideas. Uh, it's fine, but it should be all backed in data and insight. Quick question on that. Do you, th do you trust some sources of data more than others? So if you do like a survey and you get a couple of responses that say like, oh, like I don't trust this site, versus like quantitative sources. And then a piece of data could be just that you saw this cool widget on somebody else's website? Yeah. Like, is there like a staff yeah. ranking of like Yeah, absolutely. I think the, 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 the absolute truth is the behavior of the user within the product, right? That is the fact, right? You deal with the fact. The next is a level of like, you do a qualitative research of with, you know, a bunch of thousand, two thousand, three thousand people, and you get responses good enough, which is statistically significant, then you can make a fair enough conclusion. The, the least that I trust is qual interviews, right? Mm -hmm. I interview a bunch of 20 people and they have certain thoughts and you know, certain opinions. Um, I would be hesitant on placing big bets based on just those 20 interviews, right? Uh, because there could be biases involved, the type of people who already elect to come and interview and spend the time with you, they might be already your power users of your product, right? Uh, or people who have, uh, who are well wishers. So, that's how I think about it uh, from a, from a you know, data, trusting data perspective. Yeah, and to go into that, like that qual versus quant, the way that we usually handle that, because depending on what, you know, part of the spectrum that you sit on being data driven or like driven by like your intuition or these panels, is that you may have a, a bias with that. So usually if I'm working with like a researcher and they say, we, like we said, you said there, we interviewed 20 people and five of these people said this, let's make this change. I usually use that as the insight into running actually a quantitative test then. Because ideally we'd want to balance those two. We see some anecdote or potentially some evidence on the qualitative side, maybe we've heard it anecdotally through friends and family, and we want to validate that. What is the upside of that on the quant side? So usually we don't really refute those, we usually just say, that's interesting, we need to validate that with science and data. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then we also like take some of those insights and say, you know, does the data within like the in-product behavior support that, mm -hmm. any of that, right? I think, but just solely looking at that 25 people and like without doing a follow-up quant or, you know, data, I, I wouldn't trust it. That's, that's what I was getting at. I like to look at them in, in different buckets like that too. There's some areas where we know like there's a critical problem. We don't totally know the solution, but we have some pretty good ideas. That's the most data-driven ones. We look for behavioral patterns, things that we're pretty clear on. And then there's that whole like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Maybe we should look into that. That would be more like the surveys, the qualitative interviews and stuff like that. And I like to keep a, a category open. And this is always controversial at CRO conferences where it's supposed to be like data-driven everything. I like to keep 10 to 20% of experiments open for just like, fuck it, like let's try it, you know? Like we didn't see any data for this, but it looks cool. 
because then there's that serendipitous effect where you might actually run into something that you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. But it's a very small percentage of the portfolio, and I would say the largest percentage mm -hmm. is those known problems with like somewhat clear pathways to solving it. And and we we try to you know obviously we're we're a business function, so we want to keep the ROI in mind and not waste time throwing stuff at the wall. But mm -hmm. I like to keep a little portion for fun too. That's that's great. And to go back to your question about how many hypotheses, how often, the growth team, of all the growth teams I created, we usually use velocity as the metric for our team overall. Because the idea, think, if you think about velocity, given any particular win rate, imagine that only 20% of your experiments win. The more experiments that you can run with that given run, uh, like win rate of 20%, you'll have more wins. And the idea is that if you can get to those wins quicker, you can learn what not to do and what to do so that win rate, as you increase your velocity, as long as you're learning from your mistakes, you should improve that win rate over time. The challenge is that with any team, you likely have a finite amount of resources and you probably have more than a finite amount of ideas. Everybody has ideas. Once you're doing these type of work, everybody just bumps into you and be like, hey Chris, did you ever think about this? Great idea, add it to the backlog. What happens to your backlog, it gets so big and you're just constantly trying to triage it and prioritize it and you know, do rice or ice or whatever methodology you use and it just gets like out of control fast. Like you just have way more ideas you could ever do. Uh, and so usually I try to focus the team back on velocity on the time it takes to validate a hypothesis to the time it takes to, from the idea inception to the validation, is it true or false of the hypothesis? Because if not, you could focus all your velocity on just like idea creation or hypothesis gener generation, and that's not gonna move needles. Just coming up with hypotheses is not gonna move needles. Validating those hypotheses will. So trying to shrink the gap between, ah, oh, that's a great idea, versus, nope, we validated it, it's false. Trying to shrink, shrink that gap, gap down as much as you can, and getting that velocity up of how often can you validate a hypothesis completely finished. That's usually where we focus the team. And that also right sizes it depending on the size of the team. So if you're like a team of two or three people, you know, you're gonna only go as fast as you can validate those hypotheses. If you're a really big team, you may be able to go faster. So I, we usually focus on validating the hypotheses, not just throwing in more ideas to the backlog. That's something I wondered about. Um, you made a really good point on the quantity of ideas uh, versus like the time and, and traffic you have to test, which no matter what company you're at, that's it's a problem. There's a finite amount of time and traffic and resources. Um, so often we'll put these things into models like ice and rice and stuff. Um, and one of the inputs to a testing program is, is like your win rate. So it's how many tests you're running, how many you're winning, and, and you know by how much are, are the wins. So if we increase the win rate, as you mentioned, being like a, a core function of a good testing program, like that seems to me to be you're getting better and better at predicting like good tests. So that's the the confidence category, right? Does anybody, do we track, like, because um, we don't at, at HubSpot, like, about um, if you score a test very high on confidence, like, do you, I don't know, I'm wondering if there's a way to, like, improve those and track, like, your prediction rates with time and if that would help a testing program. Because yeah. theoretically, if you're predicting more and more correct tests, you're wasting less time, there's less opportunity costs. But I guess I've never seen a testing program that, like, put that into their internal kind of compass and model. Yeah. We kind of do that, not completely what you say, but you know, looking at, like we do sample size, we look at the uh, confidence, we look at past tests, you know, and the conversion rates in the past test and how much we're likely to receive you know, in this test. And so by using these inputs, we are able to conclude whether or not these kind of tests will be successful, right? Be able to predict some of that, uh, but not, exactly what you said, but I think that's something that's a, it's probably a, it's a good idea. You're yeah. using pretty much like historical quantitative data to yeah. do that. I would say at HubSpot we mostly use gut feel. We're like, this, this seems like a nice experiment. We'll give it an eight out of 10 on confidence. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's probably the wrong way to do things. Yeah, and, and for us, we usually weight the things that are based on reality. So we may have like a sliding scale from like one to 10, but like the top seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of the ranks or all, anything that's in there has to be based off of data. It can't be based off of gut. So it automatically incentivizes ideas that are based off of something you've done in the past. It still leaves room for those crazy ideas mm -hmm. and so on that you think that are gonna win that maybe have really low effort. 
Yeah, it's like a complex portfolio because I would never want to rule out a two out of 10 on confidence that might be like the biggest winner in the whole bucket of, of experiments, right? That's, that's it's um, like investing theory, right? You want most of your like uh, money going into like low risk index funds, stuff like that, but maybe you keep 10% for crypto or like startup investing or something like that where it's probably gonna lose, but it might win really big. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the way I look at like testing is basically like portfolio theory. Uh, we talked a lot about what we've got from, from, from this report, right? And what, what is painful and challenging process, people, KPI, and so on and so forth. What's, what's do you envision as the trends in growth tactics other than what we've discussed already? Like what should uh, marketing people, no matter how they call themselves growth marketers or marketing executives or whatever, what should they know, predict, consider, today to succeed by the end of, let's say, this quarter, this year, whatever. Everyone has different uh, time frames for the success to be achieved. So what should be considered or predicted to uh, succeed in the future? I would say, I mean, focus on, when I talk about the T, right? If you look at today's world, things are changing so rapidly. Right, more than Facebook, Instagram is now the next best advertising platform, right? Um, there are newer and newer platforms coming up. There are newer technologies that are coming up. So invest in yourself to make sure that you are, you are widening and fattening that T, right? Not only the expertise that you have, of course, go to conferences and learn and you know, expand the skill set that you already have, but also learn about various different functions and what's happening in your industry. I think that's the way, there's no one magical answer to this, but I think it's more about how you want to invest in yourself to make sure you're abreast with what's happening. I would definitely agree with that. And I think just from a career skill set perspective, I've never met somebody who's like too well versed in, in data and analytics. Like that's something that you can just like learn more and more about. And in fact, if you're in marketing, that's often like the weakest spot where if you can go in and like set up tags and like set up events and like build data pipelines and actually like uh, analyze your own tests. I think that's a massive skill set. That's something that uh, I've been able to do at HubSpot where there's not a lot of people on the marketing org. There's a couple, but we're, we're under-resourced for analysts. So essentially when I can go in and do those things, that allows us to move much more quickly. And with that, I said before that I think growth is gonna break off and it's gonna be more of a growth infrastructure and operations, which we're already doing at HubSpot. We're building an experiment platform, guardrails so people can run tests and with best practices in mind basically knowledge sharing systems and the data pipeline to track all of that and like line up the metrics from ac acquisition, activation, monetization. So I think that's gonna be a core team and I think data engineering, building pipelines, basically all those super technical skills. But then on the rest of the organization, the domain expertise, the problem solving, creativity, all the things that make a good marketer in general uh, uh, business problem solver, I think are just gonna become more and more important. And for those people, it's still gonna be important to, to know and understand data and be able to like basically grok what's going on when you're, when you're running a, an experiment or analyzing it. In my experience with growth teams at Mozilla and from talking to other folks that have gone through the same evolution is that there's this like constant like back and forth with growth teams from being centralized to decentralized. And so my advice would be be comfortable with that. It's really easy to start a team and try to be the subject matter expert to the end of time and be the growth team. For your team to win overall, your organization, everybody needs to adopt that. So you can almost consider a success metric for the North Star for a growth team is it eventually disappears. Mm -hmm. That eventually it becomes everybody's job and every way of thinking. So don't be afraid of sometimes of just letting go letting the organization decentralize it. And we've seen at Mozilla, it's gone through that about three or four times, from decentralized back to centralized. And every single time, it was very valid about why that happened. But if I forced it, if I forced it and said, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're the growth team. Don't be running experiments over your product team. We're running it. It wouldn't end well. Not end well for so much for me, but it wouldn't end well for the company and product overall. So be comfortable with moving away from things you're working on, allowing the team to mature, the culture to change, and then come back together when it's right. 
And, starting, and when you start to evolve that, you'll start to think that the entire organization is a growth team, and you start to be able to think about how can we operationalize this? Because there's only a finite amount of time that each one of you are gonna have to be able to impact each of those levers. So how can you take that growth mindset in terms of attracting customers, take that same mindset that you have about that and apply it to yourself, your team, and the growth thinking. It's an abstract it away from you so that you can grow your influence beyond just your own hours within a day. I love that answer. Yeah, perfect. I, I'm moderating so I cannot take notes, but I will definitely review the recording because it was really helpful and uh, insightful and actionable panel discussion. Thank you very much. And I bet you guys have a lot of questions. So we are having a break now, and I, I think you can ask your questions during the break. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.